poetry of Charles Olson binds the intuition and creativity of an American scholar who stumbled upon poetry in the second half of his life. While other poets of this century can be separated by a generational gap, Charles Olson links the two through his careful consideration for learnedness and thinking anew, as well as his practice of dismantling the structures of rhyme and meter. Within his writing, there is a sense of escape, an intrigue of time, and a reflection of death, among other themes. Olson's identity not only compounds the perfect match of scholar and free thinker, but stands nobly as an individual of purpose, describing himself not as a poet or writer, but as an archaeologist of mourning. In addition to his epic Maximus poems, Olson's work is largely experimental, academic, and at times unorthodox. For instance, in his poem Other Than, it reads, Cold, cold on the bold shore as the rock falleth, the water stands, beware of permanence. You who would run in, who in your thin shallops think to make the land, the season is forever cold. And the reason the rock, if you can call the mind, or is it from water, that images come. And the boldness, never to be ice, never to stand, never to go other than does the slow and ancient heart. To change is the expectation we previous immigrants tell you. Here, Olson works in sounds and utterances with the opening lines, cold, cold on the bold shore. He involves their surroundings as a powerful way to draw on readers, acknowledging that poems have an oral tradition, engaging with an audience through speech. Not only does Olson work in utterances, he uses imagery to outline meaning. Rocks fall into water, possibly through erosion, which points to the impermanence of humanity. We sometimes feel we're the water, ever strong against the eroding land, but we are actually the rock, unaware of our falling, unaware of the eventual collapse that is death. But within this collapsing, we fall into the water, becoming one with nature once again, as it is from water that images come. In his often canonized poem, As the Dead Prey Upon Us, Olson personifies the ghostly unconsciousness of repressed emotion. It details those feelings we often feel in regret, with a statement that these feelings are almost better off dead, if not dead already. The experience is told from the narrator's point of view, watching the dead souls swarm his mother, stating, I turned to the young man on my right and asked, How is it there? And he begged me protestingly, Don't ask. We are poor, poor. And the whole room was suddenly posters and presentations of brake linings and other automotive accessories. Cardboard displays, the dead roaming from one to another, as bored back in life as they are in hell, poor and doomed to mere equipments. While the dead souls return, they are not intrigued. They swarm the bored mother, and the narrator discovers that his mother lets them swarm her. She warrants these thoughts and feelings, immersing herself in the regrets of what could have been. Preying upon her, the dead seem just as uninterested in her as they are with hell. So dooming oneself to hell of regret is no different than dooming oneself to an afterlife in hell. Olson shows his originality in this piece, which competes with the Maximus poems for his most intriguing, most novel work of poetry. Here, Olson doesn't rely on the postmodern absurdity, nor does he format it in a way that takes away from the overall meaning. Instead, he focuses on the imagery, the feelings of regret, and the movement of time. In an article titled, Representing Alterity, the Temporal Aesthetics of Susan Howe and Charles Olson, they discuss the paradoxical relationship between humans and time from both a personal and historical context. In As the Dead Prey Upon Us, time is an important feature. While the dead are praying, they aren't tied to the tangibility of time. They are always looming, bypassing the birth and death of life, and living eternally as the overwhelming feelings of regret. The narrator compares the regrets of his own to that of his mother, who has lived longer and, therefore, had more time to encounter these repressed feelings. But in this acknowledgement, the narrator sees himself headed towards the same path. In this realization, he calls out the dead souls, saying, O oh, souls, burn alive, burn now, that you may forever have peace, have what you crave. O oh, souls, go into everything, let not one not pass through your fingers. What passes is what is, what shall be, what has. Olson identifies the past, present, and future as a psychological state of uncertainty. While our actions in the present may not become apparent to us for a while in the future, 
We will forever have regrets that loom overhead, enchanting us with their uncertainty. We don't know what could have been, we only know what is. Olson's sense of scholarship not only ties him into the past, but aligns his poems with a new format to create a postmodern representation of something historic. As stated in Alan Golding's analysis, from Pound to Olson, the avant-garde poet as pedagogy, he states, this connection between experimental poetics and pedagogy forms a central part both of Pound's significance as a writer and of his influence in a later avant-gardist and didact like Charles Olson. Here he discusses the relationship between the two, which started out as friendly, though turned sour at the difference in ideals. Olson's sense of pedagogy is important in his writings, which entangle illusion with meaning. In Olson's poem, he who in his abandoned infancy spoke of Jesus, Caesar, those who beg, and hell, he charges the title with illusion before even entering the actual poem. By their own orange cloud, their own displaced sea, they who can teach nothing of vice or of a death without regrets, nothing of a life so lived. Again, Olson talks of regret. Only in this poem, he discusses the greatness of Caesar and Jesus and how their lives were so filled with experience, with passion, that they couldn't teach of a life with regrets. Olson's work depicts the intrigue of a top scholar, identifying the practices of knowledge and brings them into the light of modern day. His undertones reflect the studies of his youth, eventually putting meaning at the heart of his words. Even outside his Maximus poems, his library of work stands novel. Without his influences of scholarship, he might not tackle poetry with the same sense of individuality, the overarching negligence of time, and the regretfulness as well as thoughtfulness of death. Olson's poetic work looms overhead, always a piece of the past, the present, and the future, always encountering the properties of life as they pass us by.